what inspired you to get into acting? What matters is the story and how you craft it. You've answered a lot of the questions already with that one answer, so that's fine. <laughs> we got 10 grand to make that script. Someone gave us 10 grand to make that film. And even with that sort of higher budget and shorter shoot time, I remember going through the script and one of the uh, one of the scenes says that the lead character steps out onto a irradiated, crumbling um, cityscape wearing a, a biohazard suit. And it was like, no, we've got 10 grand. He's walking out into a slightly dusty back alley wearing a face mask um, because that's what we can afford to do. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform. Thank you. Hi there, welcome to Film Forums. My name is Aisha Shbeli and I'm here with two special guests with me today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Adam and I'm a filmmaker from Portsmouth on the south coast of England. Hi, I'm Chris Watt and I am a screenwriter and script consultant uh, and I'm based in the northeast of Scotland. I knew you were Scottish, but I didn't know that you were from here, like right here. Um, yes, uh, from Aberdeen, Aberdeen. Well, same. Um, so in terms of how you became filmmakers and scriptwriter, how, you know, what was that journey like? I went a kind of roundabout route to it, really. I um, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I was growing up. And um, at school, I just kind of, sort of wandered through it and settled for sort of second best. I wouldn't sit in my seat. I wouldn't behave myself. I was always distracted and so on and so forth. But what I had a really good knack for was creative writing. And I had a teacher who really kind of supported me on that and really pushed me on that. Uh, and then when I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to do at college, I um, found there was the BTEC course in film production. And when I wanted to, when I went to the kind of guidance council and said, is this the right sort of thing for me to do? Um, I was promptly told, no, you're too smart for BTECs, go do, an a, go do A levels which not really knowing anything about college or anything like that, because I wasn't paying attention. I went and did A-levels in media and film and psychology. So there wasn't a lot of practical elements to that course. I learned a lot of film theory. And then I fell out of university and got a letter from the higher ed department saying that they were, they were looking for film studies teachers to teach in FE colleges around sort of where I lived. And I thought, ah, that's all right, I'll do that. Because all I really wanted was a job where I got to talk about film all the time. And that, that seemed ideal for me. So I went and I learned to teach rather than went into making films or trying to get into the industry. And then once I'd got a job teaching, I sort of found myself shunted sideways. And it was like, if you want to keep your job, you have to teach filmmaking as well as film studies. So what I found doing that and I met a wonderful man called Simon Westcott, who was a real sort of mentor to me um, throughout my early filmmaking career. And what I found was that through studying film studies, I already knew a lot about how films were put together um, and the technical stuff like how you set up lights, how you use cameras, how you use editing software, so on and so forth. That's all stuff that you can learn literally by playing. Um, and then obviously, follow that sort of train of thought and you'll pick up more and more and develop it. I don't want to sort of make it sound blasé, but the essentials of putting films together from a directorial standpoint, you can really kind of pick up just by watching lots of films. So what I found was I was really good at letting the students know what were the right choices, what were the bad choices when it came to making films. And the more I learned about filmmaking and the more I got into teaching filmmaking, the bug kind of bit me. And I wanted to have a go myself and get into it. And so I, the first thing I really made that I took seriously was my dad turned 50 and I made a documentary for him for his birthday about who he was and uh, like interviewed his family and my sister and my mum and sort of made this little film and it had old photographs of him that I animated using motion software. And I sourced a lot of clips from TV and such so when he was younger and I put all of that together in it. And uh, it was, it got such a kind of like emotional response from my family, um, far more than I was expecting it to. So I thought, oh, maybe there's, there's something in this and I can kind of roll with it. 
And I'd always liked writing. It was the only thing I was like really good at at school or really paid attention to at school. So I started writing short film scripts. I went and I made a short film called The House Near Apple Park, which is where the company's namesake comes from. And I sent that out into the world and it got into a couple of small festivals and a couple of people reviewed it. And the feedback was really positive and really kind of optimistic and people took loads of stuff from it and really kind of broke it down and really liked it. And that was even more encouraging. And I thought, well, if I've made a short film across three days for 600 pounds, then in theory, I can make a feature film across 30 days for 6,000 pounds. And I knew I could put together about 6,000 pounds um, running up to the next summer break that I had whilst I was teaching. And um, that's what I did. I got a load of students and uh, went and made my first feature film, Little Pieces. And that took about two years to fully kind of put together from pre-production through to finished product. And it was then that I met Chris via the internet because when we were looking to have it reviewed, he was one of the first people to review it. And he said some really kind and encouraging things about it. And the rest is kind of, going on from there i have the kind of cliched side of things which is that i i never really wanted to do anything else from the my earliest memory that i can even remember is going to the cinema and it's going to see et in 1983 and ever since that moment cinemas have been the only thing that's really ever made any sort of impact on me in terms of an art form and of course as you get older music and literature and things like that become more important to you but cinema is always the thing that i gravitated back towards and so throughout my school and in secondary school, as soon as I had the means, I had a camcorder and I was going about filming these little short films with all my friends and they were, they were terrible. They were rubbish. It's the sort of thing that you would just throw away, but they're all school exercises really. So it's all about learning how to construct stories and how to construct scenes and how to build characters. And it all filters in to what you end up eventually learning once you go to film school, which is what I did once I finished secondary school. I went to the University of Northumbria in Newcastle. Um, I'd written my first screenplay when I was 15, uh, but it wasn't until I got to film school and I had a very, very good script tutor named Adam Gans, who told me one of the very fundamental truths about screenwriters is that you've got a good 10 years of bad material in you before you'll start to reduce anything of any worth whatsoever. And of course, when you're in your 20s, you think, no, that's nonsense. Everything I'm going to write is going to be fantastic and it's going to get sold. And it's just not the case. And of course, 20 years later, I'm only sort of just starting to get to a level in the career where scripts are getting optioned or scripts are getting into pre-production or production, anything like that. But once I graduated from film school, um, I wrote a novel and uh, that got published in around 2012. And it was only after the novel got published that I, I started to get any kind of interest from other artists in the area. And this was when I was in Aberdeen at this point. And uh, there's a very small film community in Aberdeen. Uh, one would hope that it will get larger and larger, but uh, film culture in Scotland is... Uh, problematic to say the least and uh, if you're not central belt it doesn't seem to really have any impact anywhere else in the country but uh, there were a few local filmmakers that sort of got in touch with me hearing that I was a writer and hearing that I wrote scripts and I sort of spent the next 10 years in and out of the industry but wrote a couple of short films a couple of them got made um, not really any impact there but again it's all learning uh, and it's all school fees. It doesn't really cost anything but time. Um, and I fell into writing film reviews and film articles for uh, a few websites, a few magazines. And uh, that's, of course, as Adam says, that's where I came into contact with his film Little Pieces, uh, which I just thought was a wonderful, wonderful feature film. And, and when I got to talking to Adam after the review was published I, I suddenly realized just how little money he'd made this for and just how impressive the film was because of that and I think that's often something that the the sort of more highbrow critics perhaps disregard when it comes to low budget filmmaking is that you know nobody sets out to make a bad film sometimes it's 
merely restrictions in terms of what you can do. And everybody's trying to work it out as creatively as possible. Uh, and I could see in Adam's film that there was a huge amount of creativity going on there. And in particular, a way of framing characters and a way of telling the story, which was really, really interesting. And of course, he and I stayed in touch for the next, I think it was about five years. And uh, it was only over the course of these five years that we started exchanging scripts and material. And it's all led up to the relationship that we have now. Yeah, I think Chris is... Um... Chris is quite right to say that as well. I think that like sometimes people don't realise with low budget films like how impressive it can be that people have made stuff for such a small amount of money. Um, like I, since making little pieces, I've made other stuff and I've learned so much more about the actual filmmaking process because, of course, I didn't go to film school. I just wanted to make films. So we kind of, I had a rough idea of what to do and I kind of hoofed the rest of it with little pieces. And I look back on it now and I think in order to go into little pieces with the money I had, and like what we were doing, I must have been mad, um, like genuinely mad. But it doesn't matter because we made a film out of it, and it did. It did really well. Like the initial reviews, including Chris's, were really good. Uh, we played in some festivals. We picked up a couple of awards, and then we got nominated for like this really incredible award uh, at the National Film Awards in London. We were nominated alongside um, proper films like. Uh, the Danish Girl and Macbeth, the Fassbender one, and 45 Years with Charlotte Rampling. And that was an amazing award ceremony to go to because I could settle in with the sort of comfort that I was never going to win against those films. I could just go and enjoy the evening. And so sort of from there, everything's kind of built momentum and sped up. And I've learned a lot more because I've worked with people who are far more ingrained in the industry than I am. So I've been able to take their experience and sort of uh, learn it by osmosis and just being around them. And that's been a really valuable experience. Um, but yeah, I, kind of, I look back on little pieces and think I must've been mad to try and make that for the money I did, but it was worth it. I learned so much about just telling a story visually and sort of the, just the grit and resilience you need to make a feature film compared to making a short film. Also when first make a film you're going to have a lot of losses involved in whatever your budget is whether you're doing it on 500 pounds or 5,000 pounds or more you're going to have losses so I think also it's kind of a good idea to, to mitigate how much losses the more budget you have to play with the more loss that you're ultimately going to have and if it is a learning experience then I think it's a good idea to limit how much you can lose money wise because you're going to make mistakes in terms of scheduling and production and all those things that cost money time is money yeah absolutely absolutely and there are there are scenes that we um we had to drop from the shoot that we couldn't film because we'd, we'd booked a location one in particular um is the other half of a phone call that a character has and it, unfortunately it doesn't really affect the film too much but we'd booked this location we'd gone through all the the routes that we were supposed to go through, we'd booked it, and then someone turned up and decided that where we wanted to film was where he was teaching his yoga class that day. And um, and it was uh, it was the evening, we were losing light, we didn't have um, generators, so we couldn't take lights out. So we were making do with torches and battery operated lights, and we just, we didn't have the, the power to, like that so that was a whole evening's worth of work lost and because everything else was so tightly packed together we we couldn't afford to reshoot that scene and it was um yeah, it was one of the scenes that we had to drop and yeah you know we we lost an evening it lost us some money because we'd paid for that location um so it was all you're right like limiting how much you're going to lose is just it's important and that kind of starts at the script i think going through the script and figuring out what you can cut and or what you can compromise on to make it more in line with your budget i was going to say actually that uh, that that word compromise is 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 a word that you become very very familiar with in any film production even at the early stages of screenwriting and uh i think we were quite fortunate uh, on the project that we're working on to start from the ground up and work our way up. So we, we, we've sort of worked very carefully 
to make sure that uh, any compromises are kind of settled before we even get to a finished script. I remember the, the sh a short film I made after I made um, Little Pieces was uh, it's called Emotional Motor Unit. And um, we, we got 10 grand to make that script. Someone gave us 10 grand to make that film. And even with that sort of higher budget and shorter shoot time, I remember going through the script and one of the uh, one of the scenes says that the lead character steps out onto a irradiated, crumbling um, cityscape wearing a, a biohazard suit. And it was like, no, we've got 10 grand. He's walking out into a slightly dusty back alley wearing a face mask um, because that's what we can afford to do. Um, and, you know, you, it's a case of just when you're working on something, finding those things that you can, that don't affect the theme of the film or what the story you're trying to tell, but that you can do in a far more compromised and simpler manner. Yeah. One of the things that we talk about a lot in here is, you know, the importance of, obviously there's that word networking, but that's not just going to events and saying hi to as many people as you can and giving your business card. True networking is building relationships. And um, and obviously, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of get a little bit more into you guys, how you've built your relationship. Because obviously you're in different ends of the country and it just came by one of you writing a review about the other one's film and, and enjoying and appreciating their artwork. And I think that that's really beautiful that you then came together and now, you know, want to work on more things from that. Yeah, we, we've built our kind of friendship over the course of that five years. And it, it's, you know, it started with the film review and then we were following each other on Twitter and Chris loves film and I love film. So we'd just talk about film all the time and it would come together like that. And um, I think it was, it was last year, um, he was asking for some sort of feedback on a screenplay he'd written. It was a two-hander set in a lift. And I was like, yeah, I'll read that. Um, and uh, as I was reading it, I was just like, I can make this. Um, and unfortunately, someone else had shown interest in it already. But because we have that kind of built-in relationship, when Chris sold Freight to the people he sold it to, he was able, he, you know, he just said, look, why don't we sit down and talk about something that you would like to do and I'll write it for you and come together. And that's like, that's the benefit of that relationship if we didn't have that relationship and we'd just taken it on the off chance it would have probably just ended with him saying that i've sold that script i think you're right I, um i find uh and i've certainly found over the last five years or so that things like twitter can be very very handy for networking if we're gonna talk about networking and building relationships with people um a lot of people see twitter as a kind of dangerous place that is very argumentative but there's a very nice sort of uh, section of Twitter, which is dedicated to uh, independent filmmakers and film lovers and writers and artists and musicians and all these people coming together just to sort of share experiences and share what they can do and what they're capable of. And there is something kind of beautiful about that uh, experience. That's the only experience that I have any interest in when I go online is connection. I'm always surprised at the amount of people that use it in the opposite way, they, they they block or they argue and then block or they uh, will go somewhere just to start a fight. And uh, it just, it seems like a huge waste of energy for me. And whenever you look at the community of artists on there, using that energy in a creative way, it, it's very, very inspiring. And that's one of the things that struck me about someone like Adam is that I was seeing this work and this passion coming through from not only the work, but from his, interactions with me on Twitter and uh, I've, I've managed to harvest some really, really important relationships through that uh, social media account. Uh, and I, I think if more people were a little more open-minded to the possibilities of the technology that we've got, rather than the negative side of things, because all you ever hear about in the media is the negative side of these sort of things. Even Zoom calls seem to be getting a bad rap. I noticed that in the news this week, there was something about Zoom calls are suddenly a bad thing. Uh, but 
for me, it's been about connectivity. It's been about coming together. And uh, I think that that kind of relationship can be possible. And I think we're a pretty good proof of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think that you are a, a fine example. You're, you know, you're people who've essentially met virtually and then now you've, you've forged, you know, um, a friendship that's led to work at the yeah. end of the day. And, and we've, we've, to... we've still not met face to face yet, of course, because the pandemic no. came along. So we've just had not had a chance to. <laughs> but I think that that's amazing. Like there's something actually quite beautiful about that, because I can definitely attest to the fact that I have some friendships as well that I've built completely through online. You know, there's there's a couple of girls, Scottish actresses, and we've supported each other for years and we've never met in person but I love what they're doing and I want to support what they're doing and vice versa. They're always showing me that support. And I just think it's essential as a creative because your normal support network, your family and friends might not have the same interests as you. They might not have the same technical skills even to be able to pick apart what you're doing and help you to improve. I think that it is so important to have good creative people to bounce off of that have an outward vision it's not all about them you know what I mean it's about giving too um and I think you guys are a fantastic example of that um and of that community that exists on Twitter the creative community it's a real lifeline for me living in Portsmouth um we have a film community here but it's it, it's made up of people who very much do their own thing and I I like making films here it's where I want to make films but I'm not daft. I know that I have to forge relationships with people in London if I'm going to meet the people I need to meet to help make what I want to do happen. And having uh, Twitter allows me to make those connections. And then when I'm in London, on the like odd occasions when I'm in London for a day or for a weekend or something like that, I can then say to those people, oh, do you have time to grab a coffee with me? And because those connections are already there, it's much more likely that they're going to say, yeah, sure, okay. And so it does act as, as a lifeline in that respect. It allows me to network without having to go into a room and be surrounded by a hundred people that I don't know um, that, like you say, you know, meet and say hello to and then give a business card and then you kind of move on. Um, I find situations like that sometimes quite overwhelming I get quite sensory overload sometimes, especially if the room gets really warm. I find that I have to sort of step out. So it's much easier for me to sort of talk to people on Twitter about a subject that we are obviously both passionate about because we both love films. You know, I've found it, it works, you know, it acts as a lifeline. And because of that, I'm able to maintain connections with people in London, um, which whilst I do want to make films in Portsmouth and I do believe heavily in localized filmmaking and moving filmmaking sort of out and spreading it wider you know in order to do that you still have to be able to access the people who are going to be able to help you do that i really exactly the same to be honest it's really funny how literally everything you're saying is ringing true for me it's a very small community in aberdeen and i'm surprised that you know that i don't know you actually you know about um you know because aberdeen is really quite small in 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 every capacity to be honest but the filmmaking side it really is um like you have to be in edinburgh or glasgow really to do very much and it's it's sad because we have talented people here but everybody has to move away as soon as we want to actually progress you know that's right that's right a friend of mine uh and i we both uh co-wrote a script two years ago uh, that is set in Aberdeen and the surrounding areas of Aberdeen. And uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of a comedy adventure script, just kind of like a grown-up Goonies, that sort of thing. Treasure maps and running about the highlands and all this sort of stuff. And a, a commercial screenplay as well, the sort of thing that, you know, if it had the right financial backing, could be profitable. But it's getting that financial backing. If you say it's set in Aberdeen, they're like, no, no. The, the doors all close. I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm not sure why, because we've got such incredible facilities uh, up here and incredibly talented people. I mean, it's starting to ch switch a little bit. I mean, we recently had uh, the movie Tetris was up here. Uh, but I think a lot of that was probably down to John Baird, the director, because he's from Peterhead, which is my hometown as well. 
And I've had a couple of little back and forth with him on Twitter uh, about the sort of uh, filmmaking scene in Aberdeen as well. And it, and it was really refreshing to see him come up with a big production and stars and money and put it into the city that he knows. I thought that was wonderful. And I, we need more support like that, I think, as a film community and, and, and for our film culture as well, because, you know, we're, we're capable of a lot more than just what is what seems to be the norm in low budget Scottish filmmaking, which is either something to do with violence or to do with horror for some reason. I'm not sure why there's so many horror movies getting made rather than we've got great actors, we've got great locations. Why can't we do a big drama or why can't we do an intimate drama or so, you know. Yeah. We can even yeah. do period. We can even do period pieces. We've got a lot of uh, locations. So many castles and gorgeous locations. Yeah. Scotland, but, the the north of Scotland is stunning. I mean, if anyone's ever on the NC five hundred as a filmmaker, you're like, oh my goodness, you can just see all of your scenes. You know, I just think yes. it's, it's crazy that it's not you utilized more. I think because it's so beautiful up here. That's really. right. Um. But yeah, and and I I know also you know down south in England as well you've got beautiful scenery there that probably isn't utilised that much and everyone's shooting in London and it doesn't always make sense you know um, so we, yeah it's really sorry we're a little different here we've had some big films made in Portsmouth um, Les Misérables was um, partly shot here and um, but as a result the local council who are in charge of permits and so on and so forth have geared everything towards projects of that size. So I come along with my little short film that I've got about £2,000 to make, um, if I'm lucky, and I need to raise that amount of money. Uh, I need to like use a certain facility or something that I have to go through them for. And they're like, right, it's going to cost you X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have to stop the traffic. And, we're going to, and it's like, no, we're not going to have to do any of that. I just need to use this thing for a couple of hours. You can't treat me the same as you can treat Tom Hopper or Hooper because he's got millions and I've got thousands, possibly hundreds, um, but they've geared everything towards that. And it's just, it doesn't work that way. It's, um, uh, it's pr pricing you out of your creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So could you give us some advice? Because obviously there will be people all over the country who and probably all over the world too, that are experiencing similar barriers. How do you guys overcome those? Because obviously you are filmmakers, you are making films. So how are you breaking down those barriers? One of the best ways to do it is not only forge relationships with other filmmakers in your area and try and set up networking events with people in your area so you can meet them and find out what they're doing and how you can help each other. But also try and form relationships with local businesses because if you need a specific location you might be able to get a local business to take part for significantly less than if you went the more traditional route and tried to go through a, a local film office or something like that um one of the benefits of making films in portsmouth is that if you go into a business and say look we're making a film we don't have a lot of money but we only need to be in here for like a couple of hours you know if we buy lunch and uh, say we were going to a pub uh, if we buy lunch and uh, buy our sort of drinks and all that here whilst we're shooting is that going to be um you know all right and a lot of them will go yeah brilliant because we've not seen anything like that before so like forging relationships with local businesses is is good as well because then you can build up like a roster of locations and get them involved and um that will make your life so much easier but yeah it's about meeting people and I think sometimes with some creatives, I know it's different for actors, but with some creatives, it's very easy to kind of shy away from people. And I know this because I've done it for a long time. We know what we want to do. and We kind of lock ourselves in that kind of mindset. But I'm a writer, director. And so my career trajectory was always like, I'm going to write the things that I'm going to make. Um, and that's just, but actually the most, fun I've had making films thus far has been with things that other people have written. Um, so I've found that to be the case, you know, open yourself up to as many experiences as possible, meet as many people as possible, 
and build as many relationships, not just with other film people, but also with businesses and so on and so forth in your local area. I think that's really a good way to start off. I suppose to, to complement what uh, Adam was just saying there, I suppose from my point of view, he talks about he's a writer director. So when he writes something, he's writing it with his intention to direct it himself. Whereas I have never really seen myself as anything other than a writer. So when I write, I'm not writing for, for me to direct. I'm just writing a story. My job is to get it on paper and make it work on paper. It's the director's job and the producer's job and further down the line, it's their job to see how it's going to work on screen. And that's where collaboration, I think, comes in very, very importantly. And I don't think collaboration is a dirty word. I know a lot of writers, uh, particularly screenwriters, who have an, an almost auteur uh, way of looking at their work and they get very, very precious about their pieces of work and you have to factor in the people that you're working with and what they're seeing in your work as well and how they see it on the screen because if you're not writing it to direct yourself you can't be ignorant enough to assume that everybody has your vision and it's the vision that you've put down on the piece of paper i think one of the other important things as a screenwriter and that's really what i can speak to is the idea of writing within your means and your situation uh, because if there's anything that I've learned from the last 18, 19 months with what's been going on, it's that I know film production is suddenly going to be working on a much smaller scale. It's going to be interested in less locations, less cast, less crew, uh, less money as well. It's not going to want to work on the bigger budgets unless you're dealing with a major studio. So certainly in terms of the writing that I've done the last nearly two years, it has generally been too small sometimes even one location the, the the film that adam and i are working on is pretty much 95 percent one location with three actors uh the last screenplay that i wrote freight which uh we're in pre-production on at the moment is uh, one location it's set in a lift with two characters so that when you know that those are the sort of projects that are going to interest producers who want to create content uh but don't want to create content that's going to cost a fortune or is going to endanger people or is going to be restricted by what COVID has done to production in this country. Uh, so I would say that it's very important that don't, don't look to large stories, uh, certainly not when you're starting. Um, look to the smaller stories, look to telling stories that are impersonal to you. Something can be epic without being on a huge scale. It can be intimate and it can be epic. Uh, so I, I would always say just write what you know. I know that sounds like an old cliche. Everybody says that, write what you know, but it's absolutely true. And that went back to something that my script tutor always told me as well. He said, action is character, so less dialogue, because uh, I was always writing dialogue. Everything I wrote was incredibly dialogue heavy. Uh, and he would, he would always say, less is more. Uh, and it took me 20 years to actually get that into my thick skull that he was actually telling, telling the truth. I think as well, like tying in with the collaboration element, um, and forging those contacts with people is, especially from a perspective of screenwriters, it's important to understand that writing spec scripts is great and it's great fun and I still do it loads and loads. But the odds are someone's not going to necessarily buy your spec script that you've written. They're more likely to read it and think, I like how this person writes, so I want to collaborate them, collaborate with them on something. Um, and that's kind of the key to it, I think, is to open yourself up. Once someone, if someone says, oh, can I read your script? If they come back to you and say, I like the script, I'm not going to buy it, but I'd like to work with you on something. Like, open yourself up to that. A screenplay can be as good as a business card or a calling card, really. Uh, it might not necessarily be what they want to make, but they, if they read it and if it's well written enough and they see something in it that they like, they'll, they, then the situation can arise where you end up writing something else uh, that is more specifically catered to what the producer or the director wants. I mean, we did have another guest as well who said um, similar, he's a screenwriter, um, and it was one of our first um, interviews actually, but I'll never forget it. He said, write cheap, write so cheap that you could make it yourself. Until someone's paying you to write, don't 
don't write anything that's going to require a you know, huge budget. And I think that that really does kind of echo what you're saying in, in terms of then in the collaboration process, you could add more to it if that's, you know, possible, you know, with the, with the production and the budget. That's right. There's a great uh, there's a great screenwriting teacher in America who I believe uh, inspired Quentin Tarantino as well. And one of his things that he would always tell his students was, uh, if you want to write a screenplay, take five characters, put them in one location and chop them up. And that was his template for people. He says, how many times have we seen that movie? Take your characters to one location and then let the drama unfold in there. And you can see that in something like Reservoir Dogs. He took exactly that template take your characters one location chop them up and it, you know you don't have to specific it doesn't specifically have to be a genre piece or anything like that but it's absolutely correct right right cheap because you know the 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 less you have the more creative you have to be as well so your storytelling can get creative and uh your characters and your dialogue can matter a lot more than your plot I, I half agree with that, but the past three spec scripts I've written have been big action films. So <laughs> just because I, I fancied writing something different and these are ideas that have been stuck with me for quite a while. So I, I decided to just take the plunge and write them because I think if I get them out of my head and onto the page, then other, it, it'll allow other ideas to come forward. And it has kind of worked because I'm now having more ideas for smaller stuff that I could. But I think because you're a director as well, Adam, that that tends to filter into that process as well. Whereas when I'm writing, I'm not necessarily, I'm writing for myself, but I'm also writing for everyone because I want whoever reads the script to say, oh, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I think, you, I think you, with your larger projects, I think you, you are quite intent that you want to do those yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, for the most part. But also I, I kind of, I like making small films and I, I like making films that are about people and about drama, but I would be lying to myself and everybody else if I said that I don't want to make films with car chases and explosions as well, because mm -hmm. those are the movies I love watching. So um, they, they inspire me as much as other films do. I think that's kind of one of the freedoms as well of writing is that you can really write what you love and what you enjoy, you know what I mean? And like, I think that's kind of the difference sometimes in the different types of creativity. Like in, in acting, for example, you are, you know, you're there to facilitate a, a, a story, um, but it's not necessarily going to be your favorite genre all the time. It's it's about fitting that part and, and going for it, you know what I mean? You find a lot of actors will maybe say that they've done a lot of a certain genre, but they would never watch that genre, you know? Um, yeah. Because when you're writing, it's different. You really you can write a film that you will really enjoy watching. You know. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100. Mm -hmm. Um. So, what can you tell us also about your project that you're working on at the moment? So our current film is um, it's a contained thriller because we came up with the idea and developed it over the course of the pandemic. Um, it's called The Maya, and it came off the back of a conversation about the film uh, Freight that Chris mentioned. He sent that to me and I was like, oh, I can make this. And then he sold it to someone else because, you know, man's got to be paid at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and we were taking a long time to figure out like what kind of budget we could make it for. So, um, but Chris said, you know, let's have a chat about something you're interested in and I will I'll write something to that specification and I've always been really interested in cults I find them fascinating I'm agnostic I don't really have a specific belief structure and so I've always found it really interesting why people believe what they believe and what they you know the different things that people sort of come to believe over the course of time and I noticed as well over the pandemic because we were inside a lot more and we were on social media a lot more people would believe things that as as a as a logical person i would look at it and my view of it would be that's mad but someone else will look at it from a completely different perspective and say yeah that really rings true to me and who i am and i found that quite fascinating and i find it quite fascinating how people might use that to manipulate people and so i spoke with chris about that we had a Sort of good hours chat about it and what I find interesting and 
he went away and came back with a treatment for a film with three characters set in a church. One of them is a cult leader who has convinced his followers to give up all their earthly belongings to him, all their money, all their earthly belongings, um, because he's told them that they are going to commit suicide at seven o'clock in the morning on this specific day. And it's going to be a big group thing. And then he's about to run off with the money and his two top lieutenants corner him inside the church that they've done. And this is a long con that he's been doing. He's been doing this for about eight years. So they've got a full set up. It's a church, it's a proper building. It's, you know, he's gone in completely for it. And they trap him in there. And over the course of the night, they try and convince him to come back into the fold and it's like a battle of wits played out between these three characters who all believe in different things or at different levels, the teachings of this cult. Uh, and we also flash back and we get to see how he's taken these two vulnerable people who are in very vulnerable positions at the start of the film, how he's manipulated them into joining his cult and becoming members and becoming these two sort of strongest members because he's worked his way into their lives. And I, I find that quite fascinating. And with, it's sort of looking at these belief systems and the world around us and how technology can affect these things. There's no coincidence that he uses uh, YouTube to broadcast most of his sermons um, and how that can be used to manipulate people, but not doing it in a kind of preachy, judgmental way of people who might believe these things because I'm a firm believer that people can believe what they want to believe, you know, what they believe, and that's that's their business, not mine. My fascination comes far more from the people who might use that belief for their own gain and be very manipulative about it. Yeah, it's kind of, the, 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 I, I like to think of it as a morality tale about an immoral person. Uh, and I've always, the, the, the big drive for me in writing this was I am always interested in these big charismatic characters and how specifically in these cults and it's gen and more often than not it's men that are behind these cults there are a few women uh that have led strange spiritual cults or religious cults in the past but they primarily tend to be men and the, the ones that I really went to were Marshall Applewhite, who was behind the Heaven's Gate cult, and also Jim Jones of the Jonestown Massacre. And these were men who managed to convince a very large number of people to believe in something that there was absolutely no proof behind. And more often than not, these cults uh, sort of purport to be about enlightenment and all being for the good of the people and about living in peace. And it always comes down to money and control. Those are the two things that it always tends to come down to with these people. And I wanted to explore how a character like that can get trapped in their own sort of web, in their own deceit. And it's a catch-22. You've got his two followers who believe everything he's told them. He knows he's been lying through his teeth and he has only ever been about the money. And it's about him being trapped in a situation where he can't tell them he was lying, but he also has to try and talk his way out of them bringing him back into this mass suicide ascension, so to speak. And it all plays out over the course of one night. It's a very fascinating thing for me, because um, that's how I'm, I'm agnostic, but I um, was brought up a Roman Catholic and I went to a Roman Catholic uh, primary school. And, you know, I, I, I see not only the cults that Chris looked at, but I see it as well in some of like mainstream religions as well. I see, you know, there's that preacher in America who uh, he lives in a $4.2 million mansion and drives brand new Ferraris. And, but when it came to crunch time and there was a disaster, he wouldn't open the doors to their church, his church to let people in who needed it. And I mean, admittedly, I haven't read the Bible for a very long time, but I'm pretty sure it had very clear sort of um, viewpoints on people like that. Very clearly says that it would be extremely difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom. So, yeah, <laughs> like it's pretty explicit on, on that one. But I agree with you. You see it popping up in every religion, whether it's a mainstream religion or a new, you know, enlight enlightenment journey or whatever 
Um, I mean, even personally, I, I remember, so when I was a kid, we, uh, and I have just vague memories of it, but we started attending this sort of new church that was very, you know, modern and so on. And, um, and then after like, a, a, a little while we started realizing and, and talking to people like my mum was talking to people in the church and we started realizing that like the the missionaries or the the serve the the people who were serving they weren't really missionaries but they were literally being slaves you know they they, they were brought over from a foreign country and it wasn't like they were doing you know a one-year mission or a two-year mission like you'll see in some um religious groups which is fine they know what they're getting into but in this case, it was it was forever. You know, it, it was it was essentially like becoming a nun. You know, um, two thirds of their income was taken from them, um, and and literally they were just enslaved. And it was really quite terrible. And there was a lot of them. They were all sleeping in the same place and everything like that. And once we started to open our eyes, we were like, oh my goodness, this is not church. You know, this is not what it should be. You know, and so we obviously left. But um, and they were they were shut down for embezzlement, talk horror. Um, but you do you see that a lot, and and that really does give um religions, whether it's Muslim or Christian or whatever, you know th those mentalities don't represent the religion. Whether you agree with the religion or you don't, or you know you follow it or you don't, it's not like like you said earlier. You know it, that's not what the Bible says. So therefore, that's not really what churches should do. You know what I mean? Um, and the same goes in Islam. You'll find it in Islam, in Judaism. You'll find it everywhere. But that I think has got nothing to do with religion. That's corruption of man of of people. You know. That's right. And of men and women, we're we're all guilty of it. It's that corruption of greed. You know. That's right. Um, and the psychology behind that, I do think, is fascinating. Like I think these are really onto something there with with the story. Like I think that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's fascinating as well to because uh, I read quite a lot uh, on a whole variety of these different cults, and there are so many different types of cults. I felt a bit like I'm sort of a magpie, sort of like just like picking little bits from here and there to create. Because obviously, we had to create our own cult with its own structure and its own set of beliefs, uh, which took a bit of time to do. But uh, I, I was actually quite frightened once I had the first draft of the script written and I was still reading up on a lot of these different places. I was quite frightened by how close I'd gotten with the structure of how some of these cults work. I thought, oh God, if, if someone like me can come up with something like this and the people that run these things are way smarter than I am. And so you just got to imagine the, the manipulation that's at play and so many of the people that are the followers of these, of these cults are incredibly vulnerable very vulnerable people and they're being manipulated out of uh, family, out of friends, out of their wealth, out of their possessions. And every book that I was reading about these different cults, nine times out of 10 were survivor stories from people who'd managed to get away and had a real sort of ground view of how these things worked. And they're, they're terrifying. They're terrifying and they're still I think they're more relevant than ever, so particularly as Adam was saying with uh, the online culture that we have now, we, 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 t we tend to believe if enough voices are saying one thing, we tend to go along with it and we should probably think a little bit more for ourselves, uh, particularly when it comes to belief structures. Well, they say in marketing and sales that um, a person has to see something six times before they're likely to buy into it. So if you imagine, if you're continually being bombarded both directly and subliminally eventually you're going to start to see some truth in it or believe it and, and take it on um and I do I find that fascinating how you can manipulate the human mind um even when you study advertising analysis that could completely twist the viewer you know and it's really interesting and it, it is again if you understand how people work and how to reach them in, in that way you can get the, you can get a lot of people to agree to anything I always say you can sell anything anything can be sold it doesn't matter it could be something terrible it could be something horrible there's going to be a buyer for it there may not be lots of buyers for it but there's going to be some it's about your pitch you know um, a classic example I think is um 
is, is Coca-Cola. I used to I used to teach advertising as part of like media studies. And you know, if you break down all of Coca-Cola's adverts, they all say the same thing. Coca-Cola brings people together. That's what that's what they sell. That's that's the what the adverts sell. They don't sell Coca-Cola as, as a thing, they sell this idea. And you know, it's just that simple idea. And it's you know, it's the most recognizable product on the planet. Yeah, I agree. I I studied um, you know, all of that as well. So I did comms with media. Um, that's that was my studies. Um, but I loved that, you know, all of the analysis classes and how you can get into someone's mind basically without them even realizing it, you know. Um, and as you say, um, Chris, the people who are running these, you know, let's say businesses, you know, they're making people their business, they are experts at it. And and you even see it, you know. This similar things are applied in, in cases where you know we're talking about like Charles Manson and stuff. Yes. That was all, yep. and you know, cult fiction. You know, yeah. There was a really great book that I read. Uh, it's called The Girls. Uh, it was by uh, I've got it written down. There we go. <laughs> it was about Manson's followers. It's by uh, Emma Klein, and it's a really fantastic book about their experience within that situation. Because Manson was an incredibly interesting person to sort of look into the psyche of not particularly nice person to really think about for too long but uh the processes by which he managed to hold that much influence over those people is quite extraordinary and it's it's charisma it's confidence it's intelligence and it's unfortunate that often those things which could be positive they could be a, a fantastic positive to everyone in the wrong hands and a psychotic mind or in just even just a greedy mind can cause unbelievable ruin to so many people yeah absolutely um um are you aware of like rose mcgowan's background for example you know the actress rose mcgowan um i, I mean i I'm, I'm more aware of her sort of uh most recent stuff that she was doing to do with the me too movement and uh times up yeah she she actually escaped from a cult and mm. she landed in Hollywood homeless, you know. Um, she has an amazing backstory, but she obviously went through a lot as being, as growing up as part of a cult, cult as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and she kind of talks about the psychological impacts there as well. It's really interesting to hear it from, you know, someone who literally that was all she knew. She grew up with that, you yeah. know. That's and interesting. Was, I did not. I did not know that about Rose McGowan. I, I, I know a little bit about her background, but I had no idea that that was how she started off uh, yeah. in her wonderful Hollywood journey. Yeah, she basically had to cut off everyone that she knew and and just go to Hollywood and yeah. try and you know try and do it, and that was it. Yeah, her so terrifying really journey. Yeah. Um, but um, just to kind of wrap things up, if there was any final advice that you would give to, you know, um, Chris, a screenwriter um, or, you know, um, a director or a director writer, what would your final advice be? Uh, I would say as a screenwriter, uh, never be afraid of notes. I know a lot of screenwriters are terrified of getting notes from handing over to professionals and getting it to produce when, when your script is done don't be afraid to ask get out there and say would you read my script and not just friends and not just family you have to get it to somebody who deals in the world of what you're dealing with right there and you have to be sort of fearless in that regard and you have to be able to take rejection but you have to be able to take notes because when you're writing a screenplay you are so in it that you cannot see the problems. It's such an intimate experience writing a screenplay. It always feels uh, it's a bitter, bittersweet experience for me. You spend months and months with a group of characters and you get very intimate with them. And then once the page runs out, that's it, they're gone. But when it comes to notes, you can't fight people on them. If somebody spots a plot issue or a character shouldn't be doing that or this, that, whatever, you have to listen to them. Don't let pride get in the way because more, nine times out of 10, this will only make your story better. And that's why I find collaborations important. I find uh, 
sort of fostering relationships with other screenwriters, professional and otherwise, because whenever whenever you start out in the business, you're you're dealing with people who are in exactly the same position as you. And if you're lucky, you can get the ear of somebody that is further up the ladder. And that's incredibly important. Uh, harvest those relationships and listen to the advice. Don't be afraid of advice. I think from a directorial point of view, like the best advice, the best advice I ever got um, was that to remember the word leader implies that people should want to follow you. And it's very easy when you're young and you're starting out to see the film as being the most important thing in the through the wrong kind of prism. It's very easy to see the film as being the most important thing. So you have to bend everyone to your will to get the film made. Whereas actually being a leader is far more about fostering the relationships with the people around you, realizing that you might not know everything that you want to do. And I'll be the first to admit, for example, when it comes to cinematography, I would much rather work with someone who absolutely loves cinematography than hire someone who I know knows less than me and then stand over their shoulder and tell them what to do because I don't know that much about cinematography. I know enough to have a conversation with a good cinematographer. But I, you know, if I was to sit on, if I was to have to stand on set and light something, it would take me a very long time as I sort of figured it out and worked it out for myself. So yeah, remember that the term leader implies that people should want to follow you. They should want to go on the journey with you and that it's not about ruling with an iron fist. It's about fostering a team to make something as a team. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that advice. And thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. It's been a pleasure. Um, apologies if this has been distracting you at all. Love, I'm not sure if you've dogs. seen his poking up. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have been an absolute nuisance. I, I have... love dogs. So I could never be angry with dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I've got two of them. And normally I put them away when I'm doing an interview. So apologies. But because it was so late today and I already had another call, I thought, ah, they'll be okay. They'll, they'll be fine. <laughs> They have not been quiet, honestly. I've, I've only, heard, I've only heard one bark there near the end. That's all I heard. <laughs> Good. I've been strategically muting myself. <laughs> one of them is crying because he doesn't like it when I'm on the phone Aww. because he's an attention. And then this one is just like really playful and wants to be like, a, you know, in your face all the time. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad, my, I'm glad my daughter's not here right now because if she saw that dog, she'd be screaming. <laughs> Loves a dog. Well, we're both in Aberdeen. We're not fan of ever wanted to. <laughs> but yeah, um, thanks again, guys. Honestly, I really do appreciate your time. No, thank thank you. You. lovely. Th thanks for doing this. This is great. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you.